Hi, Dr. Alex here, and welcome to number three in the best sword fighting films of all time. Apologies for the delay once again, this time due in part to me having to go away for a week for work purposes, although this is only really an excuse because I did get distracted by other video making, including a couple of Star Trek ones, as well as general laziness and just not getting it together enough to record and edit these somewhat more work-intensive videos. But here we are, at last. We have reached the top three in the series, which is another reason for a slight delay, because I rejigged and updated the intro and outro music to reflect the increased status of the top three. The film is another French film, which will no doubt please my many French friends and even frenemies. And like some other recent films I've reviewed, starts immediately with a fencing or fight scene. In fact, as soon as the opening credits end, we are in an actual real fencing cell. Now, of course, to be in a fencing cell alone does not necessarily mean it will be a good film. However, in this case, it is a good indicator. There are also 13 different fighting or fencing scenes in this film, which has also led to a longer time in editing and cutting together the scenes necessary to make this video. And yes, the 13 fight scenes do give some indication of just how good this film is as a film, but also as a film specifically to do with sword fighting with a fencing basis. That is not to say that a film with fewer fight scenes could not be in the top 10. And in fact, there are many films in the top 10 with fewer fight scenes. We shall see when we get to number two in the best sword fighting films of all time that a large number of fight scenes is not a prerequisite to be in even the top three. But I can leave you in suspense no longer. It is time to tell you which film we're in fact looking at today. And it is... Le Bossu, the 1997 version. I make this distinction because there is in fact a 1959 version, which I'll make some reference to as I talk about the 97 one. It is difficult to say any film is a perfect film, and this film certainly is not perfect. There are some obvious flaws or difficulties with the film, and yet in spite of these, or perhaps even in some cases I suppose because of their oddity and the strangeness of them, this film works incredibly well. And I'm even more confident at placing it at number three in the list, given I did a screening of The Duelist, which was number four in the list, back to back with Le Bossu in my flat with 12 people, including myself there, which was quite an amazing feat given the size of my living room. And the general consensus was that Le Bossu was a more enjoyable film than The Duelists. Of course, these are fine distinctions when we're getting to splitting the greatness of films which are themselves in a top 10 list. And it's not to say that people didn't enjoy The Duelists immensely. It's just that people did seem to indicate a greater enjoyment of Le Bossu. And so further bolstered my confidence in placing it at number three. I will return to the problems in the film shortly, and in particular, one sizable elephant in the room, one which I'm sure many cinema goers upon first seeing the film would have decided to leave the cinema and never mention for reasons of awkwardness or embarrassment or just to let it lie and enjoy the film for what it is. But I shall expose the elephant in the room for all it is worth. I will not flinch away from exposing its weirdness and slightly dubious nature as mentioned previously. This is a French film, although technically it is a French-Italian-German co-production, with the cast mainly being French. The sword fighting I will cover in more detail as I go through each of the fights, as I usually do, but I will make mention of the fight choreographer here, who is Michel Calliez, who worked with Bill Hobbs on Cyrano de Bergerac seven years earlier. And I think you can see some influence of Bill Hobbs in Michel's fight choreography and the way in which he has constructed 
the fight scenes. That said, the fight scenes are in some ways less technical than Bill's and more showy and more flashy. The sword actions are usually quite a bit wider and broader, although there are in many scenes technical terms used and expressed like the names of the parries and different actions within fencing within the dialogue reflected in the choreography and in the fights. However, it is generally a more fun and loose form of fencing choreography in these fights than you would see with Bill Hobbs. That's not to say Bill's not fun. He would just be a little bit more gritty and realistic in his choreography than Michel Calliers has been in his. As is obviously the case, these are different choreographers. One may have influenced the other from having worked with him, but they are distinct entities and have their own styles. The music in the film is distinctive, beautifully orchestrated and written, reflects the tone of the movie very well in that it's quite light and fun. And although there are serious aspects and themes to the film, it does perfectly capture the overall feel of a fun adventure story with some odd little twists and turns. Most of the score was written by Philippe Sade. However, there was one track used at various points in the film, which was the intermezzo from Cavalleria Rusticana by Pietro Mascagni. And this did cause a few chuckles in the cinema when I first saw it, when it first was released in 1997. I was lucky enough to see it in the cinema at that point. And unfortunately for the film, the piece of music I just mentioned, which was used in this scene, caused chuckles for a reason I will elaborate momentarily. The music in question had unfortunately also been used in several advertising campaigns in the recent past relative to the release of the film. I am almost certain that there was either a Stellar Artois or Cronenberg 1664 advert which involved a peasant farmer traipsing across the French countryside with exactly that piece of music behind him. This was in a period when Stellar Artois were trying to shake off the unfortunate nickname of Wife Beater and the associated distasteful image that they were carrying at the time. And it is questionable whether they ever successfully shook off this image. Of course, back then, it was a simpler age, a less PC age. Who am I trying to kid? It was the mid to late 90s. PC was fully ingrained and entrenched by that point, And basically, things are pretty much like they are now. I did manage to find this one advert where, again, clearly the music is very prominently featured in the background. And so I guess this choice of music was a little hackneyed, but you can forgive this because the film is just beautiful both in its visuals and in its soundtrack. As I mentioned previously, this is not the first adaptation of this story in film. There was a 1959 version of Le Bossu, which I also happened to see once and once only. I do now own a copy, but I've not yet had a chance to rewatch it. When I was a child, well, in my mid-teens probably, it was shown once, as far as I'm aware, on British TV, at least that I noticed, 
because I happened to catch it, probably on a weekend, probably on a Sunday, and it had been dubbed, but very well done. And even though I only saw it the once, the story stuck in my head because it was just as imaginative and just as odd and weird as it is in this more recent retelling in 1997. And indeed, the acting and the sword fighting was excellent in that film too. However, I have a more fond and more immediate memory for the 1997 one. All that said, when I saw Le Bossu in the cinema for the first time in 97, I immediately knew that this was the same film as Le Bossu that I'd seen on television probably seven, eight, nine years before. And as I say, it shares the same plot, and it even shares some of the same problems as that earlier film. Very strangely, in the subtitles and on IMDb, the film was entitled En Garde in the English translation, and yet I'm fairly sure when I saw it in the cinema in the UK, it was just advertised and promoted as Le Bossu, and titled as such. And although we have had subtitles for it, I don't remember that coming up in the subtitles in the cinema. They certainly come up on the subtitles in the copy I now have at home. And Le Bossu does not mean En Garde. It means The Hunchback. And The Hunchback is a character that is integral to the plot of this film. And in fact, there's more than one of them. But before I get more deeply into the plot of the movie, I'll go through the cast, which will actually enable me to talk a little bit about the plot. And so, first up is Daniel Otil playing Lagardère. And he is the main character and the hero in this film. And I think, in terms of his acting ability, excellently cast in the role. He is charming, funny, energetic, and yet he is also one of the main problems in the film. Cette fois, je vous présente mon neveu, Lagardère. Je crois qu'il soldat. Engagé euh, Dégagé, monsieur le duc. Mais n'était-ce pas pour sept ans J'ai tué un colonel. Compliment. Mon colonel. Aïe. Oui, une histoire de femme. Bien excusable. Sa femme. Aïe, aïe, aïe. Puis-je quelque chose Je brûle de percer votre secret, monsieur le duc. Mon secret La botte de Nevers. Me feriez-vous l'honneur d'un combat, monsieur le duc in the earliest scenes in the film, he is meant to be 20 years old. You can work out from the dialogue in the film and time that passes and ages of other characters mentioned relative to his own. It is easy to pin his age down at the opening scenes where you see him as 20 years old. By the end of the film, in the closing scenes, he is 36. No, accompagné. Accompagné. Es-tu bon comptable Pour l'estimation de votre fortune que l'on dit immense, il faudrait tout de même euh, trois jours, monseigneur. Flatteur. Oh, agir courbé. On prend le pli, n'est-ce pas <rire> De l'esprit, voyez-vous ça Oh, nous autres cabossés avons deux choses bien pendues, la langue et... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Et quoi encore et Une certaine affaire qui plaît bien aux dames, monseigneur. <rire> Coquin, tu m'amuses, hein? C'est lui que. Allons, canaille! En garde! Montagne! Do you think Daniel Thiel pulls this off? This is an interesting question, particularly given the fact that Daniel Thiel was 47 when he took on this role. I mean, he looks good. I won't deny it for 47, but does he make a convincing 20-year-old? Does he make even a convincing 36-year-old? I mean, that's a little bit closer at least, but that is one of the problems with the film. Bizarrely, it is one that is shared with the earlier 1959 version as well. The actor in that case, Jean Marais, was himself 46 when he played Le Bossu and was again 20 in the early scenes of the film and presumably would be 36 by the closing scenes of the film. It is an interesting choice of casting in both cases, but to be fair, both actors are excellent, and it's not the first time that actors have been selected who are older than the roles they're supposed to be. The Three Musketeers, for example, are all either in their late teens or their early to mid-twenties in the original Three Musketeers novel, something that's not often realised when you watch the film productions of it. Rarely has it been cast that way. I don't think even the 90s D'Artagnan's Bogus Journey casting managed to hit the ages of the actors low enough to truly represent the novel. And again, another example would be Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, in 
the first story, The Study in Scarlet, has only really just left university, and Dr. Watson, although he's just come back from a campaign as an army surgeon, is himself relatively new to his career as a doctor, and has been injured out of the army, but is again in his mid-twenties, probably at most. And again, rarely do we see Sherlock Holmes and Watson portrayed as someone in their twenties. However, this is modern casting for a film where the ages of the characters are integral to the plot, and it's undeniably a problem in the film the way they've done it, but it's not the biggest problem in the film, so I'll give them that. And yes, so far, I'm still not addressing the elephant in the room. The next character I shall touch upon is the Duc de Nevers, played by Vincent Perez again, who we've seen in Cyrano de Bergerac. Colonel. Aïe, une histoire de femme. Bien excusable. Sa femme. Aïe, aïe, aïe. Plus quelque chose. Je brûle de percer votre secret, monsieur le duc. Mon secret. La botte de Nevers. Me feriez-vous l'honneur d'un combat, monsieur le duc Jeune homme, ta présomption m'agace. Acceptez-vous He is important, although only in the first half of the film, and is the father of the main female lead in the film, who I'll come on to in a moment. Fabrice Lucini plays the primary villain in the piece, that of the Comte de Gonzague, who is very much a palpy character, at least in look, but psychologically is a much more fragile, or even fractured, and in later scenes certainly haunted character than Palpatine ever was in the Star Wars movies. Ils entrent dans le grand salon. C'est à nous. C'est à nous. Oh non. Non, je n'accepte pas. Oh non. Les morts sont morts ou bien, ou bien les lois naturelles ne sont qu'une farce. Celui qui a tué cet homme, je l'ai aussi. Moi-même. Qui t'a traversé la cervelle Monsieur le cadavre. Quitte à traverser la cervelle, monsieur le cadavre. Lui Encore et toujours lui the mother of our main female lead, the lover of the Duc de Nevers, played by Vincent Perez, was Blanche de Caelus, played by Claire Nabou. C'est pas le bâtard qui ose élever le ton. Oui, père. Qui se taise. J'ai l'interdit de parole sous mon toit. Mais c'est un nouveau-né. Raison de plus pour qu'il se taise. And she does a great job of conveying a character who's quite carefree at the beginning and then distraught and destroyed by events later in the film. But I guess I can dance around the elephant no longer. The elephant in the room is our main female lead, the character of Aurora, daughter of the Duc de Nevers and Blanche de Caelus. And she is played in the earlier scenes by a baby and in later scenes by Marie Julian, a Belgian actress. Tout fait comme à l'épée. Comme ça. Slap, slap, slap. Oh, 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 oh. Ah. Arrête, 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 arrête. C'est pas un jeu de fille. C'est pas un jeu du tout. Mais pourquoi tu, tu n'obéis jamais Pourquoi tu me tiens tête tout le temps comme un garçon Parce que j'ai pas une mère pour m'apprendre à être une fille. Mais c'est moi ta mère. <rire> Ma mère, mon père, tout who herself does an excellent job of playing a fairly light character and a carefree character, but one with a certain amount of grit and determination, and who will definitely stand up to defend her friends and family. But here we have the elephant in the room regarding this entire story. Essentially orphaned at the beginning of the film, at the tender age of three months, when the Duc de Nevers is assassinated by Gonzague and his goons, she falls into the care of Lagardère, and so Lagardère is her de facto parent. And yet, by the end of the film, they end up like this. Maintenant tout droit. Je veux dire plus près. Encore. Je voulais te tais-toi. Lagardère literally got the girl. It's just so bizarre. Now, I know some might say, ah, but it's French. And I'm pretty sure that my French friends and even frenemies would probably still object to that as a justification for the way this narrative plays out to go from father of a small infant child baby to lover of same person. And using, well, their French as an excuse would probably cause my French friends and even frenemies to throw a fit. However, 
if you can get past this one enormous, bizarre, strange, weird, disturbing aspect of the film, it is still a fantastic adventure story. And so, let it be said, I have addressed the elephant in the room, and now I'm not going to, well, probably not going to mention it ever again. We shall see. Before moving on to the fights themselves, I'll quickly run through a few other aspects of the casting. Notable among them are Philippe Noré, playing Philippe Duc d'Orléans, nephew to the king, also relative to both Nevers and Gonzague, Gonzague being the cousin of Nevers, and essentially acts as a sort of patriarch to the whole of this extended and intermarried, interbred family that d'Orléans, Nevers, and Gonzague are all clearly part of. And also the king as well. Uh, Louis is also relative to the Duc d'Orléans, uh, being his uncle. Lagardère's adopted family, for he is himself an orphan, are an important part of the supporting cast. Uh, you see them initially in the first scenes where they are running the fencing salle at which Lagardère is either training or indeed perhaps even involved in the training of other fencers. And on the other side, we have Perrault, who is an excellent, creepy, sinister character with some humour, but mostly just a dark and ruthless sidekick and henchman to Gonzague. Lui, voyez Pérole. Une fine lame. Le plus jeune, là C'est celui-là qu'il nous faut. Mon <coughs> oh, Dieu, j'ai un trip en feu. <coughs> Combien vaut ton bras, celui qui tient l'épée Au moins, au moins, ou à l'heure Juste pour ce soir, un fâcheux qui nous encombre. Ah, ah, ce soir, mon joli, moi, j'ai, j'ai pas le temps ce soir. Pour sans louis Ah, pour sans louis, j'étais de n'importe qui. Comment, mon neveu, qu'est-ce que j'entends Tu vends tes services pour un salaire d'assoui Tu gâches le métier. À 200 déjà, tu brades. 300, me semble raisonnable. 400, tu les vaux. Oh Sans louis maintenant. Sans autre à la livraison de la carcasse. Je paye. But his understated and sickly portrayal is no less brilliant for its understated nature. And so I think I've covered everything I need to about the setup and plot and characters, actors and problems of the film and we'll deal with any further plot and character notes as I go through the fights themselves. Because, as I say, there are 13 fights. Hopefully this video won't be over an hour long, but you never know. I'll try and plough through as quickly as I can. And so we come to the first of the fight scenes, which, as I said before, starts immediately after the opening titles and the music is finished. It begins with a fencing cell with students under instruction being told to perform sequences for a little while before being allowed to enter free play, which, while stylized, is very reminiscent of a modern fencing cell in terms of structure of a typical day's training. The weapons are practice epées, not foils as far as I can see, which would be consistent with the types of weapons being used at the time, this being the very end of the 17th century, about to enter the 18th century, 1699 at this point 
in time. And the weapons that they would be training to use would be small swords. Small swords, in fact, of the type that we saw in Captain Blood. So hilts that are larger than the later 18th century small swords as we saw in Scaramouche, for example, but with blades which were very much of the same sort of cross-section, an epée-type cross-section, just like the blade I described seeing on Samuel Pepys' small sword, which was identical in cross-section to a modern sporting epée. So all seems well with the accuracy of the weapons being used, but perhaps you should wait until fight three. Now we move on to fight number two. It should be noted that all three of the first three fights occur within this first scene and reflects just how compact the first half of this film is in terms of the sheer density of fencing and fight scenes that have been crammed in. So we see the fight begin with one of the most ridiculous salutes ever. It does go on for some time. Barely has the fight begun that we see another instance of nose blowing. You may recall one of these from The Duelists, although in this case it was a genuine need to blow the nose, whereas in this it is difficult to tell if the Duke really needs to blow his nose or if it is just some sort of affectation or ploy to annoy his opponent. Whether deliberate or not, Lagardère definitely seems to be irritated by the action and his fencing and his fighting in this scene is somewhat aggressive, angry and a little wild. The fight in general is a bit on the broad and expansive side in terms of its actions. The actions themselves being quite army on the one hand and also the footwork quite dancey and in fact the entire movement of the fight uses a lot of the space and is definitely on the dramatic side more than the super hyper realistic end of fight choreography and fencing. It should be noted that Lagardère is left-handed and that both of them have parrying gloves on. Uh, Lagardère in particular can be seen swatting the blade away on a couple of occasions with his parrying glove. After the Duc de Nevers essentially plays with Lagardère for a period of time, he then decides to demonstrate his famous attack, or one, as we later find out, of his famous attacks. There are two. In the attack, the first three actions that he numbers really seem to be nothing more than distractions, taking his blade out of contact or out of reach of Lagardère, while at the same time throwing Lagardère off balance or, as I just mentioned, distracting Lagardère, rather than any actual attempt to engage or perform regular fencing actions as we recognise them. The fourth numbered action is a bit more standard. It's a bind from Octave through to Cut. As a quick note, from an epée perspective, this is a somewhat risky action. You're taking the blade entirely across your body while doing this. And this is equally dangerous in a dueling situation. You're taking the point across your body. At any point, your opponent could thrust through, if well-timed, and hit you. However, I suspect the distractions and the element of surprise are supposed to offset the risk in this particular 
particular part of the action. Finally, the fifth numbered action, the final part, which should lead to the death blow in Neves' attack, has a rather large 1-2-3 action, with the third action being something akin to a cutover, although it's really more of a cut backwards, in some ways similar to some of the seeding parry recoveries you used to see in Old Saber, where you would swing the weapon backwards from a seeding parry to then cut to head. This is almost never seen in competition Saber these days. The sport has moved on since these actions were practical and effective. At the same time as swinging his blade backwards and round, he also swings his body and his legs to bring the rear leg forwards, such that his entire body now moves closer to the opponent, with his arm back ready to do a very forceful thrust through the head, the forehead specifically, of his opponent. Again, in fencing, you would not generally see people bringing their rear leg forward or their body closer to their opponent. It is just too risky. You are going to get hit. But again, the preceding rather extravagant, but certainly distracting actions of the 1-2-3 presumably have rendered his opponent's blade position ineffective in itself and allows him to get this strong position where he can just ram the blade through the person's forehead. All in all, it is debatable how realistically effective Nevers' first attack, as described in the film here, would actually be, but it's certainly a dramatic piece of swordplay and a suitable and fitting MacGuffin to help move the story along. Now we reach the third fight scene. A peu lourd, peut-être, hein? Mais magnifique. Merci, cousin. Essayez là, vous serez conquis. Je vous conseille celui-ci. Un gaucher. Bien. Pourquoi non? Moi? Surtout pas une erreur, c'est lui le plus fort. Pourquoi Parce que le roi est son oncle, il s'amène à chaque fois qu'il se croise. Sans façon, sans façon. Allez, voyons un peu votre science, mon garçon. Ah sur un macaron. Ça amuse quelqu'un que j'ai glissé sur un macaron Here, Lagardère has been volunteered as target practice for Philippe, Duc d'Orléans, in order that he can try out the new small sword he's been given by his cousin, the Duc de Nevers. It begins with some fairly placid, if clumsy, tapping and hacking by Philippe, but after he knocks Lagardère onto a table, Lagardère loses his temper and comes back a little more strongly, avoiding the Duke's clumsy thrust, and in the process, the Duke slips and falls to the floor, which he then blames on a macaroon. Of course, there are no macaroons. Everyone laughs and then realizes they shouldn't because this is the nephew of the king. From a fencing perspective, there's not much more to say, except this is the first point we get to see a small sword close up in this film. And there is something wrong with these swords. They are all far too heavy. The Duke claims that his sword is a mite heavy, but actually it's absolutely representative of every small sword we see in this film. The blade looks too thick, and I'm not sure why this is the case. I don't know if they've made the swords thicker so they can be seen more easily, so they can be seen more easily by the cat camera or by the actors who are using them to fight with in order to prevent accidents perhaps. If they've made them heavier to slow down the actions again to make them either more visible or perhaps more safe. But for whatever reason these blades are the right length for small sword blades but they are definitely too broad and probably too heavy to be accurate small sword blades. As I said Samuel Pepys small sword which actually would be dated about 10 to 20 years earlier than these blades is exactly the same cross section as an epee blade. The Captain Blood ones although they are replicas for film, they were the same cross-section as epée blades. The later swords we saw in both Scaramouche and the Duelists were epée cross-section blades. There's absolutely no reason why these blades should have a more almost sabre-like profile to them, when they are supposed to be small swords, and they are for the most part used like small swords. This is an odd inconsistency and historical inaccuracy in the film, but it's one that can be overlooked because the sword fighting is still fun and it is still a great film. So now we reach the fourth fight in the film, the ruffian ambush. Mais c'est le duc de 
le verre Oui, et alors Although Perrault has hired Lagardère to take part in the ambush, upon seeing it is the Duc de Nevers, he holds back, either out of some liking for the Duke, or at least a desire to face the Duke under honourable or fair circumstances. Ultimately, presumably, to learn more of the Duc de Nevers' secrets, or to finally best him in combat. In the ruffian fight itself, there is some element of waiting their turn, but it is done quite well in terms of the fight choreography and the cinematography. It is not painfully obvious that they're waiting their turn, but there are aspects of one person is taken on at a time, but it is woven in quite subtly, and the scenes allow some justification. For example, when the Duke de Nevers leaps up on the fountain, he's in a narrower, confined space. There are walls to either side of him, restricting the access of the four assailants, and essentially encouraging them to get in each other's way. So some of the waiting their turn aspects can be justified in the logic of the film, as they have been forced to take their turn because they are getting in each other's way. There's an interesting and bizarre stance taken up by the Duke de Nevers, where he's got one sword under his arm and the other one wrapped around the other side of his body and he roars at his opponents. This entire setup presumably is to confuse and throw off his opponents and it seems to work. We see the Duc de Nevers famous attack being employed. At this stage we don't know that he has two. This is still the first attack or a very close variation on the first attack that we saw when he was demonstrating it to Lagardère. And near the end of the fight there is some nice two sword fighting on the part of the Duc de Nevers with some very tricky actions where he basically does a one-two with one blade and then stabs the guy with the other blade because his attention has been drawn by the one-two and that weapon and is unfortunately, fatally, ignoring the other weapon. And now we come to fight number five, immediately after the ruffian fight. Merci! Foltron! Monsieur le Duc! C'est moi. Encore! Cette fois-ci, plus de quartier! <coughs> Tu vois la spadassin Qui te paie Une sale gueule. C'est un peu vague. Tu as la vie sauve si tu me dis qui te paie. Je sais pas. Mais même si je savais, j'ai guère l'habitude de trahir. As-tu l'habitude de mourir Là, tout de suite, là Rien ne peut plus te sauver. Que ressens-tu à l'idée de quitter ce monde Bonfant. Here, Lagardère has now finally stepped from the shadows, seeing his chance to challenge the Duc de Nevers once more. He seems very happy and good-natured about it, whereas the Duc de Nevers is understandably annoyed at this apparent second attempt on his life by backup ruffian, who then turns out to be Lagardère. And he has no patience for the good-humoured way in which Lagardère accosted him. He's now determined to dispense with him once and for all. We see Lagardère, to some degree, successfully counters Nevers' attack number one. The Duc de Nevers is unable to complete the sequence and leave himself ready to stab Lagardère through the forehead. Unfortunately for Lagardère, we're now introduced to the Duc de Nevers' attack number two, which leaves Lagardère at his mercy. We shall, in fact, be given a lesson in the Nevers' attack number two in the not-too-distant future. And now, as promised, fight six is indeed the lesson from the Duc de Nevers to Lagardère on his second attack. Okay, 
Pierre, on les cesse bien. La mort. Où est jusqu'à qu'il lui s'enferme et bouge, retiens ici. Tu n'y arriveras jamais. Allez, 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 monsieur le duc. Sois plus alors, écoute-moi bien. Tu connais la première botte La deuxième te rendra invincible. Vas-y, attaque. Parade de septime, riposte. Enveloppement de cartes. Battement sur le bras. Ah. Prise de fer, en changeant de main. Désarmement. Ah. Au front. Ah. Évidemment. Mais au front, ça peut pas entrer. Si. Juste là, précisément. À toi. Frère de sang, chevalier. Vous m'avez rendu immortel, Philippe. Immortel. As described by the Duc de Nevers, the second attack begins with Paris Septime, a riposte, followed by envelopment cart, beat forearm, prix de fer, and then what is simply described as disarm. This is not the clearest instructions in the world, and I will now go through it a little bit more slowly with a bit of augmentation to aid the understanding. So it does indeed seem to start with a paricept team to the opponent's attack, a riposte which is direct, presumably to elicit a subsequent parry riposte from his opponent, setting the opponent up for his envelopment cart, where he basically takes it in cart and then does a circular action around the blade, gathering it firmly into his guard in cart. This is then followed by beat forearm, which is not a move often seen in fencing, in fact, beating to bits of the body is generally frowned upon, followed by what he describes as the prix de fer. The prix de fer specifically, in this case, is a bind from cease to septime, and then the disarm, which follows immediately from this, actually involves the duke changing hands as he turns his body, and as he's changed hands, he has grabbed the sword arm of his opponent. The disarm really is essentially grabbing the sword hand or arm of his opponent and taking it out of commission. Simultaneously, he's turned his body and his opponent opponent round, and similar to the Nevers attack 1, he's now ended up with his rear foot forwards, although technically because he's changed hands, that was actually always his front foot, but that's getting a bit complicated. Anyway, basically he's ended up with his sword arm back, his now front foot backward, and again ready to thrust through the forehead of his opponent. It is a complicated, possibly over-complicated sequence, but this is the second of the Nevers attacks. Before I talk about fight number seven, I would like to mention an effect this film has had which is common to one or two of the other films I've reviewed so far, and that is that it has in some ways bled into my fencing. Now the two previous obvious examples were the first fight in Cyrano de Bergerac, which directly affected the way I was fencing immediately afterwards, and the first duel, the opening scenes really, of the duelists, which again, that small sword fight, affected the way I fenced both with my left and my right arm. It's not as obvious or as strong in the case of Le Bossu, as these two films where there are specific fight scenes which I know have directly informed or affected the way that I've fenced, this is more a general influence probably brought on by my having to analyse so many different fight scenes, but it has introduced a level of playfulness back into my fencing, which is something that's always there anyway, but there was definitely yesterday when I was fencing between editing fight scenes more experimentation and playfulness. I was only fencing one person, there was only one intermediate fencer who turned up, so it was a very long session where I started with my left hand, which is, by the way, for the last six months, my habitual way of warming myself up. I start fencing with the left hand for a couple of fights and then switch to the right. And my left hand is getting pretty damn good, I have to say. If uh, I guess that's kind of immodest. But uh, anyway, the point is I fence with my left and then I fence with my right. So at least my friend got two different opponents to fence. But the main point I am trying and failing to make here is that, again, I feel the influence this film has is another indication of just why it is ranked so highly on the list in the seventh fight scene where Nevers is attempting to escape with Blanche and his daughter Aurora. Ah! <laughs> 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 
We do see some elements again of opponents waiting their turn. Never and then later Never and Lagardère, when he joins him, have multiple opponents to fend off, and there's a little element of opponents hanging back or being down for an unrealistically long period of time before rejoining the battle against the two outnumbered heroes. But again, it's fairly well hidden in the choreography and the way that the scenes are shot. The fencing is itself quite expansive and army, i.e. a little bit on the showy side, but it is nonetheless entertaining. These fights are exciting and have a certain level of realism if a little bit on the waving the arm around side. Errol Flynn would be proud. There are some nail-biting dancing over the baby, some teetering on the edges of ledges. We also see the Nevers attacks used But Nevers is finally taken out by Sneaky Gonzag with a knife to the back from behind. Just prior to fight number eight, we see Lagardère teaching Aurore to read using a fencing manual. Apart from this being quite a funny little scene, it actually will help explain Aurora's not complete ignorance of fencing and swordplay later in the film, and this with some importance. So here we see Lagardère defending the camp when all the other men of the Italian performance troupe that he and Aurora are hiding with and working with have gone away, and he has to resort to using a stick because his sword is hidden under one of the wagons and is not accessible. Once again, we see a variation of the Nevers attack here. 
in fight number nine, we see Lagardère teaching Aurora a simplified version of Nevers attack. And we also get some hints at the changing nature of their familial relationship. Après. C'est de naissance. Dès que j'ai un bâton dans les mains... Mais non T'as tout fait comme à l'épée Comme ça Schlap 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 Oh 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 Arrête, arrête, arrête C'est pas un jeu de fille. C'est pas un jeu du tout. Mais pourquoi tu, tu n'obéis jamais Pourquoi tu me tiens-tête tout le temps comme un garçon Parce que j'ai pas eu de mère pour m'apprendre à être une fille. Mais c'est moi ta mère. <rire> Ma mère, mon père, tout. Je vais... Je, je vais te confier un secret. Et un secret de famille. Ce que tu as vu tout à l'heure, c'était la botte de Nevers. C'est qui Nevers Nevers, c'est un... C'est un grand seigneur. Un jour, je te raconterai. Oui, un jour ou jamais. Je vais t'apprendre la botte de Nevers. Bien. D'abord, tu dois déstabiliser ton adversaire. Ensuite, tout est dans la fin. Réfléchis. Tu pars en sept pieds. Riposte. Tu prends toi. Carte. Enveloppe. Battement sur le bras. Prise de fer. Désarmement continu. Au front. Mais au front, la lame ne peut pas rentrer. Mais si. Il y a une faiblesse, là, entre les yeux. Faiblesse Bon, reprenons. En garde. The tenth fight scene occurs after Aurora and a young male friend of hers from the troupe get invited to a party held by a noble after one of their performances. And once there, things take a sinister turn. Marie Jelaine is always hilarious in her portrayal of Aurora whenever she has a stick or a sword in her hand, and this fight is no exception. Her character's wild and erratic but enthusiastic swordplay, coupled with her luck and, of course, the invincible protection of plot armor, somehow see her through the fight, and she manages to execute a fair approximation to the Nevers attack in order to finally defeat the sinister noble who is attempting to rape both herself and her friend. Fight 11 occurs after Gonzague has successfully captured Aurora and is about to send her to the colonies in Louisiana, which is invested in. And Lagadère, upon discovering this plan, has to rescue her with almost no time to prepare. Oh, <laughs> 
Tu vas descendre Assez de manière. Soyons modernes. Expéditifs. While there are lots of weapons in this fight, there is some fencing, so it has to be included. There's more hilarious whirling aurora. And also one of the most obvious instances of waiting their turn in a fight scene in this movie. In the twelfth fight, Perrault surprises Lagardère on the roof while Lagardère is still in his disguise as Le Bossu, secretary to Gonzag. Ah, dans le grand salon. C'est à nous. C'est à nous. Much as the hump buckle saved him from the bullet in the previous fight scene, his hump itself protects him at one point from a blow from Perol. We don't see how the fight ends in terms of the actions, but we do see plenty of evidence as to exactly how Perol's met his end. The 13th and final fight scene in the film mostly involves Gonzag attempting to avoid the fight at all costs, having had his crimes exposed and being forced to defend his honor in a duel. Allons, canaille En garde Les duels sont interdits, il y a des lois. Je lève l'interdit pour l'heure et j'en appelle au jugement de Dieu. Et Dieu se met toujours du côté des plus forts. C'est un combat inégal. Il connaît la botte. Il, il va m'assassiner. Je suis tout de même de votre parentèle, cousin. Quand j'ai du mauvais sang, je me le fais tirer. Traître. Traître. Ce sont des vocations. C'est un maison de trahir. Hein C'est un jeu. On fait semblant. C'est autre chose que le ragoût quotidien, mais un traître véritable, hein Un traître de goût, un traître de sang, un traître gourmand de traîtrise. 
Eh, Judas, au fond, eh bien, c'est un artiste. He does finally decide to fight, but only once he's managed to get a sneaky blow with a candlestick on Lagadere, which temporarily blinds him due to the injury and the blood. At this point, it is nice to see Aurora directing Lagadere because of his injury, although it seems as this final part of the fight progresses, his vision is coming back, and she directs him to the final blow and beyond. This concludes my review of Le Bossu. In the interest of brevity and in a desperate and I'm sure futile attempt to keep this video under an hour, I should just say I hope you can see why in spite of the elephants, this deserves its place at number three. I hope my French friends and even frenemies are happy at its inclusion at this point. And I have to thank Michael, the anti-tracker, for kindly allowing me to use one of his super chats with regards to the terrible stereotyping of the French. I hope you'll all join me in number two in the best sword fighting films of all time. Take care.